The first thing I want to say is uh, about the, the, the data of the day. So uh, 5,544 cases so far in Australia and unfortunately 30 deaths. Uh, so we've had an increase again uh, over the last 24 hours. The good news about that is that the, the daily increases are definitely less than they were uh, a week or, or so ago. Uh, and that really talks to uh, the effectiveness of some of the, um, issue, uh, some of the ways we have, have uh, tried to uh, deal with the, the virus over the last uh, uh, few weeks. Um, but I, I want to talk about that data. That's still, even though that is an improvement in terms of the numbers of cases uh, that are coming every day, there's still about 250 people that are uh, uh, contracting the virus and still five people that have died in the last 24 hours. These are real people, uh, real examples, and it really talks to why we are being so tough uh, in relation to uh, some of these really quite large changes that have happened in our lives um, over the past uh, few weeks. Um, it also, uh, the other issue I'd like to, to mention there is that uh, any, uh, anything we try to do to slow the spread of the virus does take some time uh, before we can be sure that that's making an effect. So much of the decrease in the daily cases we've seen uh, in the last week are really to do with what we did at the border two or three weeks ago in relation to de uh, decreasing people coming into Australia, decreasing that travel-related uh, push of uh, virus uh, cases in the community. Uh, and that is about the biology of the virus. It is, uh, there is a period between being infected and being uh, diagnosed with the disease, um, and it's about, uh, about a week. So it generally t will take two or three weeks after introducing a measure before we see the full effect of those things. So at the moment, we're, we're tracking quite well. That, that flattening of the curve we've talked about for some time now appears to be happening. But I really would caution uh, thinking that we've got through this completely because we definitely have not. Uh, and we really have to be hyper vigilant now uh, in collecting the information uh, and making some decisions about what that, what that means in terms of um, the people that are getting uh, infected, the people that are getting sick, those that are using our hospital system, uh, those that need to be admitted to intensive care uh, and so on that some of these restrictions are very, very tough. And, and I think it's incredible and, and extraordinary how Australians have embraced these, uh, these uh, different, different ways of living. Uh, even in my own family, I know that uh, my nieces and nephews, for example, very, very active, uh, some of them uh, in their early teens. Um, and, and they have, have on average had 30 hours of, of sport a week. Um, and they're no, no longer able to access those uh, team sport events. And so they're looking for ways that they can uh, deal with this at home, uh, looking at ways to keep physically active, but also to take advantage of the 30 extra hours a week they have to interact with their family. Um, so these are, these are important things. Many people have been separated from loved ones. In my own family, there are people um, in New York, uh, in the UK, uh, in Italy, um, they cannot be seeing uh, uh, their parents at the moment, my, my siblings. So uh, these, are, these are tricky times. Um, my own daughter has lost her job. So uh, these, are, these are real events affecting us, both from the virus itself, uh, as well as um, uh, the effects on our society. And uh, these are, uh, is a difficult balancing act, uh, which we will continue to be led by the data and the information that we're gathering our experiences we're gathering from other parts of the world who are some months uh, ahead of us in terms of, uh, uh, of the virus um, and the epidemic. Um, and that advice will go to government and those decisions will be made um, on a regular basis. Uh, so I think uh, the only other thing I would like to mention because it, it was, has been making quite a lot of news overnight uh, is in relation to mask use. and. Uh, the CDC, uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the U US, uh, have made some advice about the US situation uh, and, and uh, the use of masks in the community. Uh, we've been talking about masks a lot here, and particularly in relation to, uh, to masks and their use in healthcare, 
Uh, and we really, from our national stockpile perspective, had made some, some gains there in terms of uh, supply coming from overseas uh, and also building up the capability in Australia to make our own masks. These are very important, crucial steps uh, to make sure that our healthcare workers on the front line are feeling safe about caring for people with this highly infectious disease. That's incredibly important and that will remain our focus. In terms of mask use in the community, uh, I would stress again at the moment, we do not uh, think that is a good idea, partly because of that uh, constrained supply, um, but also the effectiveness in relation to, uh, to people uh, walking around with, with masks. The key point there, uh, masks can be useful uh, to stop the spread from a person with the disease to other people uh, if that mask is used correctly. Uh, that's true. And secondly, if the mask is a, a, a something, a mask that is uh, uh, um, manufactured in the way that we uh, support it from the Australian standards. Um, but at, at this time, the, uh, our advice remains, if you are sick, stay at home. Uh, if you are sick and you need to, to seek, for example, health uh, professional support, please ring ahead. Uh, and, and there'll be appropriate ways of, of dealing with that safely uh, when you get to, uh, to um, the fever clinic, the emergency department or wherever it is that you are uh, going to your GP, for example. So for the moment, mask use uh, not, not recommended for the Australian public and uh, we can continue to look at ways and indeed we are actively looking at ways of, uh, of thinking about masks use uh, into the future. So I'll leave it there and I'm happy to take questions. Just to explore that mask question, Dr Kelly, are you saying that even when supply reaches an adequate level that it could be readily available for community use, uh, there's almost a, a psychological or behavioural reason why you what, don't see Australia going down the US path? Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a slightly complex question, but I think the, the first thing is the constrained supply. So let's leave that one aside for now. If we had unlimited numbers of masks, I think it would be important to have a conversation with the Australian community who, un unlike many countries in Asia, where it's very commonly uh, used uh, to, to wear masks for a variety of purposes, partly uh, pollution related, but also uh, issues of personal hygiene and so on. This is not a... a, a uh, a way that, in general, Australians uh, use masks, so uh, there's that side of it. The second, second side is using a mask incorrectly can actually make it more dangerous. So, for example, if you're not used to wearing a mask, it can become quite uncomfortable, uh, even claustrophobic, um, and indeed um, can make one uh, it can become quite itchy underneath the mask. And so uh, touching a surface with, uh, with the virus scratching yourself underneath the mask could in fact increase your risk uh, rather than decrease your risk. Uh, so so if, if we got to that point, uh, then certainly there would be a, a, a need for a strong conversation and, uh, about uh, how to fit a mask properly and how to use it properly so that it would be used safely and effectively. There's been news out of China that they're reopening wet markets. Is that a prudent move or does that risk further outbreaks? Uh, so uh, wet markets are common uh, in China and many other parts of, of Asia, including Southeast Asia. Uh, wet markets are, are places where uh, live animals are, are for sale and uh, there's various reasons for that, uh, cultural as well as practical ones, uh, in, in places without uh, a great deal of refrigeration, for example. Uh, those decisions will need to be uh, taken by the countries concerned. Uh, I have been involved in, in the past looking at avian influenza, for example, and outbreaks in Indonesia and other places. Um, and, uh, and certainly there are ways of making wet markets safer. Uh, but in general, as we've found with this particular outbreak, uh, a so-called zoonotic outbreak, a, a um, virus that has spread from one type of animal, uh, other types of animals into humans, uh, wet markets where there are a lot of live animals in close proximity to a lot of humans uh, increases that risk. Uh, but in terms of this particular virus, uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, uh, virus, um, 
really that jump from the other animals to humans has already occurred. And so the, the major risk really is in large numbers of, of, of uh, humans coming together rather than the uh, markets themselves at this point. There is noticeably cooler weather sweeping through the southeast of Australia, even talks of snow on the Alps. As far as survivability, either airborne or on surface, is there anything you can tell us about temperature ranges uh, that may or may not uh, affect the virulence of this disease? So uh, the, uh, the SARS-2 SARS virus, which causes COVID-19, uh, is a respiratory virus like flu, like cold viruses and others. Uh, we know that during the winter months, this uh, tends to be uh, uh, to transmit more easily. Uh, and there's a range of factors uh, related to that. One of the factors uh, we have dealt with in terms of the social distancing measures, that's, uh, that's indeed us uh, tending to congregate together inside in larger numbers during winter than we do during summer. Uh, and so that won't be the case uh, in this winter. And, and indeed, some of our early um, uh, surveillance in relation to the flu season, which we've started earlier this year because of the COVID-19 uh, issue, is demonstrating that um, the influenza-like illness surveillance, uh, this is um, a series of questions that's put to people in, uh, in our flu tracker survey, and I would encourage people to uh, join flu tracker have a look at it in your, in your search engine uh, and you can sign up for a very quick 15 second survey every Monday uh, asking you if you've been sick uh, with flu-like illness um, uh, in the past week. Um, that is demonstrating that actually it's decreasing uh, since these social distancing measures have come in um, and in fact is at the lowest level that it's been uh, for some years at the moment. So, uh, so that's one side from the, from the winter perspective. We may well um, show that we are having less problem there because of that social distancing. Uh, but on the other side, we do know that low humidity uh, and low uh, temperatures uh, do tend to promote uh, the infectiousness of respiratory viruses. And we suspect that this particular virus will be similar. And just on social distancing rules, uh, what's your advice to people in situations such as residential colleges or boarding houses where it's not a family gathering per se, but people are uh, co-living in the same space? That should they be uh, socialising together? Well, I, I think they should be uh, ex, ex, uh, examining the way that they, they live in those circumstances. And I understand that many boarding houses around Australia have closed or are planning to close shortly in relation to the Easter holidays. Uh, and, and that's a, a good thing, I think, in terms of the, the boarding houses uh, related to schools. Um, communal living is a challenge uh, in these situations. We've, we've, uh, we've seen already outbreaks in, in uh, cruise ships, for example, also uh, backpacker hostels and so forth. Um, anywhere where there are larger numbers of um, people living in the same place, it's, it is more challenging to, to have this social distancing. But there are very uh, 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 practical things that can be done in relation to increased hygiene, hand washing and so forth, um, as well as uh, thinking about how to keep that physical distance. So coming into the kitchen at different times, for example, uh, making sure surfaces are also clean between use uh, and the like. Where uh, and, and I'd say the same as I was talking about my family in relation to the way that people are living. Um, people are making these, these, uh, these uh, adjustments all the time, both in their workplaces and at home. Um, a shout out to the, to the hairdressers that are working through that as well in terms of, uh, of, of social, uh, not so much social distancing, you can't do that when you're cutting someone's hair, but, but the hygiene measures I, you know, I've seen uh, very practical and, and, and well done for people taking those messages on. The Health Minister's announced that the government sourced 2,000 courses of hydroxychloroquine, if I pronounced that correctly. Hmm. How will those be used and is that safe to distribute across the country? So hydroxychloroquine is a, uh, a, an anti-malaria drug originally. It's been around for a long time, uh, at least 50 years. Um, it's uh, and used as a, as a way of preventing malaria uh, and indeed treating malaria. Um, over the last few years, there's been 
uh, a lot of resistance in, in malaria, so it hasn't been used as much. Uh, it has some other uses in relation to, to arthritis and, and, and some other conditions. So uh, it's important that, uh, that hydroxychloroquine is not wasted. At the moment, it's an experimental drug. Uh, and it, there are some clinical trials that have started uh, in Australia and elsewhere uh, in relation to this. Um, some early work done in France is, is, uh, is positive, um, but very preliminary. So uh, to answer your question specifically, those, those drugs are, are aimed uh, to be part of uh, controlled clinical trials uh, to make sure that uh, this drug is safe to use and is effective. Okay, thank you very much.